By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we bring you more action from the Often Troll Cup, the old school magic tournament that was held in Leeuwarden, the Netherlands. And uh, it was such a fun tournament to be a part of. And I'm extra excited to show you this match because it's a match where I am actually playing in with my signature deck, Timmy's Spellbook. So I'm really looking forward to show my deck in action at a tournament. And I'm playing against Anis and Anis is playing with Urnum on Ice. Now, both of these decks are still undefeated. So this promises to be a thriller of a match. Um, if you'd like to know more about this tournament, by the way, uh, please check out the description below. There you will find uh, information about the rule set, but also a link to the Often Troll Facebook page and to the Instagram page. So if you want to know more about the tournament, check out the description below. Talking about the description, you can also find timestamps there. One of those timestamps reads MTG Games. If you click on there, that will take you straight to the action. And as for now, we are going to continue with the deck deck section of the video, and I'm going to start with my own deck. Let's take a look at Timmy's Spellbook. And here we see Timmy's Spellbook, my signature mono blue deck. I'm really excited to show it to you today in a uh, tournament video. That doesn't happen that often. This is my latest iteration of the deck. And Timmy's Spellbook has a lot of flavor, but I'm not going to talk about the flavor right now. I'm really going to focus on what this, this deck wants to do. And it's really a control deck. So this deck usually in the first turn one, turn two, turn three, turn four, it's going to take damage. You know, life is a resource. Life is going to buy me time. So that is going to happen regardless. Um, you know, turn one, I'm, nine out of ten times, I'm just going to play a basic island and pass, which is not ideal, especially in old school, right? It's difficult. So the turns that follow up, I really need to kind of control and stabilize the board. That's my main goal. So uh, as, as soon as I've got two blue open, I'm going to try to keep that open. I'm going to try to keep that threat alive towards my opponent, trying to or have a counter spell in hand or pretend that I have a counter spell in hand. And what I usually counter are not the big creature threats. And maybe this is a surprise, but in the deck, you know, I've got a lot of answers. Well, a lot, I've got, I've got answers to creatures. Of course, I've got a double control magic that I want to play on the bigger creatures. Like, for example, you know, Sarah Angel or, you know, Sengir Vampire, creatures like that, or Isuchi, right? And then I've got a Psionic Blast, which I can also use to get rid of those same creatures. The smaller creatures, I basically want to ping to death with my Protocol Sorcerer. So I really want to use my counter spells against other big spells, you know, the, the restricted cards like Balance, for example, or Mind Twist, or a direct damage spell that can finish me off, you know. Because I take a lot of damage usually early game with this deck, countering, you know, if I play against a Red Mage, countering like a big Fireball is really, really important. Another thing, remember, I'm playing Mono Blue. The problem with Mono Blue is once something hits the table, it's really difficult for me to get rid of it almost impossible. So I really have to time my counter spells well. I really have to think what to counter and more importantly, what not to counter. And talking about what not to counter, I'm also playing with two City in the Bottles. Now City in the Bottles, of course, extremely strong. Some people say it should be restricted. Maybe, maybe it should. Um, I'm playing with two main and the reason I'm playing with two main is not to protect me from you know, Urnum Jin, uh, Juzem Jin, Surrender Pafrit. Yes, they work great against those creatures. Curdape, we see Curdape more now as well. Yes, Sedina Bala works great against those creature threats. But actually, the main reason I'm playing them is to deal with City of Brass and Library of Alexandria, and especially Library of Alexandria. It's such a strong card, it can, you know, dominate a match. So I want to have an answer to that. And remember, I am playing blue, so, you know, I don't have access to cards like Ice Storm, Stone Rain, Sinkhole, Armageddon. No, I'm playing blue. You know, I don't have that luxury. So my, my Sydney Nabato is also going to help me to kind of deal with those really strong Arabian Nights lands and maybe even punish my opponent for, you know, having a greedy mana base that depends too much on City of Brass. Um, what else is there to say? I think this deck is more than just a control deck because it also has a lot of creatures in there. I love playing with creatures you know I, I just I love casting one of my beta air elementals it's just such a beautiful card I love playing Papa Moti being able to clone my own Papa Moti that's always one of the one of the goals in every single match and I also love my fleet you know I love my two ghost ships ghost ship I think it's really a good card it's a card that initially I didn't play in this deck but um, I saw it in other blue decks and I thought wait a minute I'm playing mono blue 
This is a really good card. For four mana, you get a two four. Four toughness is a really solid blocker. And also I can regenerate it for three blue. There are a lot of Disco Troll decks here. So it's gonna be super good against Disco Troll. And that's also why I've put two more ghost ships in my sideboard because against specific decks, this is just such a good creature that I wanna board in. Um, well, this is basically my deck. If you have any questions about, you know, choices I've made, things you're wondering about, feel free to ask them in the comments below and I'll try to explain them to the best of my ability. This is my deck and now we're going to look at the deck of my opponent, Anis. Let's take a look at his Urnum on Ice Brew. And here we see the deck of Anis Urnum on Ice. And I know this deck really well because this is the deck that's actually designed by my brother. He was the one who decided to take Armageddon's out and put Ice Storms in. Now, um, I guess the biggest difference between Armageddon and Ice Storm is that an Ice Storm is pretty much a no-brainer to play whenever you draw into one. Especially early game, of course, the Ice Storm is better. The later you draw the Ice Storm, the less good it gets, you know, the less decisive it gets, uh, especially in this deck, because this is really a tempo deck. Um, and with Armageddon, you really have to time it right. You have to decide when to play it and when not to play it. But I guess the advantage of Armageddon is that it can still be a pretty big deal later in the game, whereas Ice Storm kind of loses its power as the game takes longer because then your opponent already has more and more lands out and losing one land. I mean, if you've got, you know, let's say six lands on the board and he destroys one of them, it's only one out of six. But if you're really early in the match, let's say it's the second land of your opponent you destroy, then it's half of his mana base, right? So that's why you really want to play out your Ice Storm early. And that's also why I'm looking at Urnum on Ice and I'm seeing it as a tempo deck. Because if you look at the strategy, what Anis wants to do here is, you know, or get a Lunawer Elf out turn one, or get some of his Moxen out, or a Soul Ring out, or maybe that Felwer Stone, which is, it's nice to see a Felwer Stone, by the way. Most people would choose a uh, Birds of Paradise, but Anis has chosen to go for a Felwer Stone. That's quite interesting. Um, so what he wants to do, right, he wants to get his Mana Ramp out, turn one, if he can. Then turn two, he wants to play uh, an Ice Storm, and that Ice Storm is going to do wonders. It's gonna work as a double-edged sword because it's gonna take a land away from me, but it also means that Anis will have a land extra compared to my mana base, right? And he already has a lot of cards to ramp in. So he's going twice as fast as me at the start if that Ice Storm strategy works. And then he can start playing out his big beefy creatures. And he's actually got quite a lot of creatures. This deck, this iteration of Urnum on Ice is very creature heavy. We see four Suchis, we see four Urnums, we see two Sarah Angels. Those are 10 creatures with a power of four. That is huge, you know, that is going to be a big problem. He's also playing with Mishra's Factories. That's even more aggression, right? And then on top of that, of course, he's playing with the, the wide control package, Swords to Plowshares, Disenchants. So he can kind of control the board with those cards protecting, you know, his creatures, making sure that he can keep attacking with his creatures. You know, he can disenchant my Icy. You know, he can sort my possible blockers. Uh, you know, he can sort my ghost ship because I can't regenerate from the swords. So, I mean, those are all weapons that he has. So it's definitely a really strong deck. I also like Sylvan Library in the Urnum on Ice strategy because sometimes, because you're ramping up so much, you can get out of steam, you know, and then your Sylvans help you with that. This is really a deck where you will have to play aggressively with the Sylvan. Just take those eight damage for those two extra cards. It's worth it. Because if this deck is working, I mean, Anis will, have, will win the game really quickly. If the deck is not working as it's supposed to, then probably we will still be playing and turn five, six, or seven, right? That's basically my goal. That's what I'm going to try to do. So I will probably put in, after sideboarding, I'll probably try to put in some extra Maces of If, some extra Control Magics to kind of you know, control the board. And um, it's really going to be up to Anis to try to put as much pressure on as possible. And I think the land removal can be key in this matchup because land removal is deadly for me because I already have a slow deck and land removal is key for him because it gives him that tempo advantage that he is looking for. So I think this is going to be a very, very interesting match. Uh, the last thing that I would like to point out before we go to the actual action is the inclusion of Divine Offering. I think it's really nice that you see more and more players do this, where they play with three Disenchants and one Divine Offering. Don't underestimate the life gain of Divine Offering, because there are so many artifacts that have a casting cost of four, like Neverneural's Disc, like Icy Manipulator, like Gem Day Tome, that are really worth it to be destroyed, and then getting those four extra life 
that is usually an extra turn, right? An extra swing of your opponent. So that can really be huge. Don't underestimate that. So I think if you're playing with four disenchants, check your deck. I think in most decks, it's better to play with three disenchants and a divine offering. I am saying most decks, right? Because it also depends on the local meta. But I've been really impressed with Divine Offering when I see people playing with three discs and one Divine Offering. Anyway, that's just my two cents. Do with it whatever you want. And I guess that means that we've now talked about the deck of Anis and we looked at my deck. So that means we're ready for the match. Let's take a look at Timmy Spellbook versus Urnum on Ice in round number three of the Often Troll Cup. Game number one, here we go. I'm sitting on the left. As you can see, I'm on the play here, starting with a basic island passing turn to Anis. And he's starting Mishra's Factory and a Soul Ring. And this is what I was afraid of, that he's going to ramp up. Now I've got two blue open. So let's see if he can cast that Ice Storm in his second turn. That's what he wants to do. And it's actually an ideal scenario for him. Yeah, there we see the Ice Storm. So now if I have a counter spell, I have to do it, right? And that it's not really a bad exchange for Anis. Like, you know, I mean, Ice Storm for counter spell, and I have to basically do it. I have no choice playing a Mishra's Factory of my own, by the way, in passing turn here. So this is what my deck usually does. That is nothing <laughs> at the start. There we see a Basic Plains and oh, Black Lotus. Is he going to be able to ramp up to something? I do have counter mana open, but then again, I've already played my first counter spell. And he's cracking the Lotus, so I'm kind of expecting maybe a Sarah Angel here. Or are we going to see a Suchi? Okay, we're going to see an Urnum. Then the question is, am I going to counter this? It looks like I'm not. And then he's going to cast... Oh, a Suchi as well. So an Urnum and a Suchi here. Oh, man. And this is just his third turn, so I'm really toast if I cannot find an answer to this. Okay, there's a maze, at least an answer for one of the two creatures. And I've got four cards in hand here. No, five cards in hand and passing turn. Wow, this is, this is still a problem, though. Like, he can swing in and deal four damage, which is not a bad deal for him. Does he have even more? Oh, an Ice Storm. Oh, and I cannot counter. Oh, man, that's eight points of damage. I'm going to drop to 12 here. Things are looking very bad for me. What I need right now is a control magic. And do I have a control magic? I do have something at least. Maybe it's a copy artifact. Not ideal. Tapping to... Okay, playing city in a bottle. And interestingly enough here, I'm not keeping two blue open. So I wonder why I'm doing that. Possibly I want to keep my factory to block if he attacks with his factory. I do think that's a bit of a misplay, to be honest. I think it would have been better to just keep two blue open. I mean, it does save me two points of damage in this case, because I'm sure he would have attacked with this uh, Amishra's Factory otherwise, and showing my uh, Mahamoti Jin there on the camera. Almost enough mana to play my Mahamoti. That would be so sweet. Ooh, Swords and Disenchants. And am I going to play my Control Magic? Looks like I am. No, I'm not. I'm, this is actually better playing my Icy Manipulator. But as we just saw exactly, Anis has that disenchant in hand, disenchanting away my Icy. And now drawing into another one. So he's going to attack for four here. Oh, he's actually going to attack for six, of course. And that means I'm going to drop to two. Two measly life left. It's looking really bad. Remember, Anis has that Swords to Plowshares in hand. So already doing a victory dance. Let's see what I can do. At least I'll be able to cast a Mahamoti Jin, right? Ooh, I'm going to do something else. Am I going to play Control Magic? Am I going to play a Control Magic here? No, I'm playing another Icy Manipulator, it seems. A lot of glare, but I believe that's an Icy. So at least I can use the Icy now. No disenchant in response from Anis, so I can use the Icy. But then I'm still dead. I can't... No, there's nothing I can do. He can animate the factory, and then I have to choose, because I cannot animate the factory and tap one of his attackers. So there's, there's nothing I can do. Yep, that's game number one here for Anis. He simply went too fast. And this is kind of the scenario that I discussed 
in the deck tech, if Anis can get that land removal going, if he can get that mana ramping going, it's gonna be really tough for me and it actually did. So now we're going to go to our sideboards. I guess I'm gonna board in some Control Magics and Mazes of If and hope for the best in game number two. Game number two is about to begin. So at least I'm on the player. It looks like we're both keeping our hands, starting with a basic island and pass here. So I need to win this game to stay in this one. It's a best of three and at least won the first one. Starting with the Mishra's Factory. Look at that Black Lotus cracking the Lotus. Oh man, earn him Jin turn one. This is so bad. Okay, this is good. Ancestral Recall on the end step of Anis. Hopefully I can find a city in a bottle here and kill the Urnum Jin. Let's take a look. I've got a lot of cards in hand at least. Hopefully I can do something with it. Maze of If would be nice as well. Let's see what I can do. Okay, playing an island, tapping one. There is Soul Ring and a Prodigal Sorcerer, a Timmy. Okay, that's nice, it's cool, but <laughs> it's not gonna help me much. I'm entering a world of pain here. If he can play a land, he can animate the Mishra's factory. That's exactly what he does there, finding a Tundra, attacking you for six. That means I'm gonna drop to 14. Oh man, what a horrible, horrible start. Well, a great start for Anis, but horrible for me. Dropping to 14, or things are looking very bleak. I mean, if I can find a control magic, I can kind of solve the situation. So it's not hopeless. Tapping four, is this gonna, going to be a control magic? Yes, control magic taking over the urn. I was like, or control magic or icy manipulator, both is okay. And there, look at that, finding a strip mine and taking care of the tundra. And it looks like I'm completely back in this game again. There's another Tundra passing turn. And I want to ping him for one in his end step. And he actually decides that he wants to attack instead. And that gives me the option to trade. So I'm going to block and ping and I'm going to trade. I think this is a great trade for me because I'm slowing Anis down here. And he's losing another mana after losing the Tundra. Only having one Tundra left now. I think this is a great exchange for me. And of course, I'm hoping here that Anis doesn't have a disenchant in hand. So I'm gonna attack for four here. It's gonna drop to 16. And uh, yeah, this is the <laughs> this is a dice that doesn't have a one anymore. Uh, it's a long story. Anyway, attacking for four. So Anis is gonna drop to 16, playing a Savannah passing turn here. Still no disenchant. So that is good news for me. Attacking here for four. So he's gonna drop to 12. And I'm passing turn. Hey, things are going okay. I'm just passing turn, keeping counter magic in hand probably. There we see a double Lanawer Elf and a pass turn. So it's looking really good for me so far that Urnum Jin is doing a lot of work for me. I'm attacking here. And I wonder if Anis is gonna chump here. He's actually taking the damage, gonna go down to eight. And I wonder if I've given Force Walk to any of the two Lanawer Elves. It's not super relevant, but still, you never know, you know, when these, these things can uh, can be relevant. Tapping four, will we see a Suchi here? Okay, there's a Suchi, four, four. That means that now he can potentially double block on a Lana War and a Suchi, but I'm casting a Mana Drain. So that means that next turn I'm getting four free mana. That is awesome. So there you see that dice indicating the four mana I'm getting from my Mana Drain. Using the four mana from the Mana Drain here and playing an Icy Manipulator. And this is ideal because um, the Mana Drain mana allows me to end play the Icy and keep two blue open to possibly counter. And this is the kind of magic that I want to play. And this is probably why Mana Drain is restricted. It's such a good card. And uh, it looks like I'm going to give Forest Walk to one of the two Lanawer Elves and attacking here with the Urnum. There's the Charm Block by Anis and untapping it with the Mace after damage is dealt. And uh, Anis wants to tap the mana, but I'm saying, no way, no, no, it's mana drain. The IC is paid by the mana drain. And let's see what Anis can do here. Playing a mana, sorry, playing a City of Brass. And casting a Sarah Angel. So he is taking a damage. He's going to drop to seven. Sarah Angel's looking good. It doesn't look like I have a counter spell in hand. Or I don't want to use a counter spell. Choosing to tap the Lanawer Elf. I'm gonna attack. And I'm 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 basically telling Anish, if you don't want to take the four damage, you know, you gotta 
chum block with your Sarah Angel, and I don't think he's going to do that. So he's actually going to drop to three here. And again, this is that one dice that doesn't have a one. <laughs> so, so Anis can basically look forever. So it looks like he's on seven, but he's actually on three here, just to clarify. And okay, playing. I thought it was going to play a Sionic Blast to end the game, but that's not what's happening. Playing another Timmy, Protocol Sorcerer. This is number two in the game. And as you can see, there's one in the graveyard. And um, that means that next turn, I can actually ping Anis to two, then I can tap a City of Brass, then he's on one. So maybe the Protocol Sorcerer is going to be relevant here. You can really see Anis here being in the tank, so he's going to play an Ice Storm. And I'm actually countering the Ice Storm. I really want to keep my Maze of If. And he's going to attack here with the Sarah. Obviously, I'm going to use the Maze. And now I want to ping, but I can't do that because my Timmy still has Summoning Sickness. So that's a mistake on my part. I think that's something that Anis is <laughs> pointing out right now. And we're trying to think of what kind of plays I did last turn. And you're absolutely right, Anis. I cannot use it. So in my turn, I'm now using it. I wonder if that's the right play because he's on three. I might as well ping him for two. Anyway... Tapping four. Are we going to see another Control Magic? Oh, Control Magic on Sarah. That's the game. Yes. Okay, 2-2. Two, two. Really happy with this because it means I'm still in the running here. Remember, both of these decks are undefeated. So this is round number three. So hopefully I can squeeze out a victory here. We'll know soon enough because we're going to continue to the all decisive game number three. Game number three, the decider. Who's going to win his third match here at the Often Troll Cup? 60 plus old school magic players at this tournament. There we see a great start by Anis Chaos Orb turn one with that Mox Sapphire there together with the Tropical Island. So what can I do here? Playing out a basic island, that's it. I just have to laugh because every turn, starting opening turn, I mean, I just play a basic island to pass. And there we see another duel from Anis. Let's see what I can do here. I mean, he can if he flips on my island, it's actually pretty annoying. I'm a little bit surprised that he doesn't, but of course it depends what he's got in hand. And they're playing an Urnum. Let's see, do I have an answer for this Urnum? It looks like I'm a little bit in the tank. Perhaps I've got a Maze in hand or Control Magic in hand or better options than just to play a counter spell here. Or maybe I just don't have any options and I'm, I'm pretending to have options. That's also an option. <laughs> Playing a Loa here, Library of Alexandria. Okay, at least it's going to give me one card. So I'm going to draw a card. And what I like about this Loa is it's going to give me a card. So it replaces itself. And I'm basically forcing Anise to flip on my Library of Alexandria. And I'm actually discarding and land here. So I'm a little bit surprised that... I immediately went for that extra card because now I have to discard. If I would have done that in Anissa's turn, I could have just kept eight in hand. So I think that's a little bit of a misplay. Maybe I have my reasons, but I'm not quite sure. Maybe I was hoping to find something. I wonder what Anissa is going to do now. I'm kind of expecting him to flip here on the Loa. He's definitely going to attack for four. Also played a Mistress Factory, by the way. Another big problem. For me, because it means more pain. So he's going to put me on 16. And is he going to flip? Yes, he's going to flip. Am I going to respond? I'm actually going to put one blue in my mana pool. Because remember, when you activate Chaos Orb, you don't have to say what you're going to flip on. So... I think he's going to flip on Loa. I don't know for sure. If I still want to counter whatever he's going to do after the flip, I'm now putting one blue in my mana pool. Um, and the nice thing is, this is his second main phase because he's already attacked. So the whole second main phase, I'm going to have this one blue floating in my mana pool. It's not going to go away until after um, the main phase, the second main phase. I think that's what we're kind of discussing right now. And I think... I remember Anise also saying, oh, yeah, I made a little mistake here, but I wanted to flip on the Loa anyway. So he's flipping on the Loa here. Let's see if he's going to hit it. Yeah, that's a hit. That's a very good flip here by Anise. Loa is gone. It makes sense, of course, to flip on the Loa. 
But now the question is, is he going to play something out, potentially running into a counter spell? Okay, he's going to do it. Or not. Yeah, tapping four. Another earn him. Do I have a counter spell here? And yes, I've got a mana drain. Bam. Yeah, I remember this play, of course. And I was just so happy with this scenario because now I've got four in my mana pool. And, and four is the same cost of an icy manipulator. And there it is, there's the Icy Manipulator. That means I can use the Icy now to tap down the Urnum and kind of stop the bleeding a little bit. The life totals here of Anis are not correct, by the way. He's still on 20, he hasn't taken a single point of damage. And I am on 16, that is correct. Let's see, and he's playing a Divine Offering here. And of course, in response, I'm tapping down the Urnum. And that means that Anis is going to go to 22, and I'm not able to counter this Divine Offering. And yeah, I mean, it's just not looking great for me here. Now he's on 24. Uh, he's going to hit me for two, so I'm going to go to 14. I mean, this is going to be really tough. That Divine Offering was perfect. Let's see what else I can do here. Okay, finding another land. Do I have another Control Magic? Playing a clone, okay, that's cool. Playing a clone on the Urnum, and that means my clone is now getting forced walk probably from the Urnum Jin of Anis. And this is actually great because it means, you know, he cannot really attack. I mean, he can, of course, but I could just block, yeah, I'm just gonna block the Urnum here. Urnum on Urnum. Remember, they're both four five, so that makes them excellent blockers. That is so special about the Urnum that five toughness makes such a difference. It's also one of the reasons why I like Earth Elemental a lot. It's that five toughness. It survives a lot of combat scenarios. So now both Urnums have Forest Walk, but of course I, my Forest Walk is more relevant because Anis actually has forests. And oh, I'm gonna flip as well. Am I now gonna flip on his Urnum? This is what a blue player wants to do, right? Copy it and then take care of it. And yep, there's the flip, it's a hit. Not as nice as Anis, but at least it's a hit. And there was quite a lot of pressure on this uh, on this flip, I can tell you that. I don't think I'm gonna attack here. Because I'm on 10. Got two blue open to counter, so things are kind of looking up again after that uh, kind of shaky start. And two Mishra's factories here for Anis, and he's just passing turn. So if I would attack here with the Urnum, he can decide to double block. Uh, which means I'm basically trading an Urnum Jin for a Mishra's Factory, which is not ideal. Okay, untapping everything again. I mean, maybe I've got a Psy Blast in hand. In that case, I can attack, and then upon activation... Okay, so he's attacking here, then upon activation, I can destroy one of his factories. It looks like he's just taking the damage, gonna drop to 20. I've got six mana open. Am I gonna play a Mahamoti Jin? That would be so sweet. So he's going to animate both, and I'm going to animate one, and okay, there's the Divine Offering, taking care of my Mishra's Factory, and I'm tapping it for a mana, it seems, or not. Okay, to cast a Psy Blast. Oh, no, I'm... Okay. Okay, I'm a little bit confused what's what's actually happening here. Okay, I blocked it, made it a 3-3, then he played the Divine Offering. And then I played the Psy Blast, so I'm taking two damage here as well, so I'm going to drop to 6. And they're playing a Maze of If. And if you're wondering why there are so many Mazes, uh, I put them in after sideboarding. I put two extra Mazes in and two Control Magics in. And I think this is, there's so much glare on that card, by the way, I think this is an Icy Manipulator. And I'm now kind of checking out his mana base um, to decide if I want to tap anything with my Icy Manipulator, deciding not to. And there we see another Mishra's Factory, so I'm probably going to tap down a Factory. And then I'm going to swing in with my cloned Urnumjin. I mean, Anis is still in 16, it's still everybody's game. Ooh, Ancestral Recall, this could be a changing point. That's going to give me some more fuel. Attacking here with my Urnum. And we see Anis dropping down to 12. Untapping the Urnum again and passing turn. 
And there is a Sylvan library. He's saying, are you going to counter this? I'm deciding not to. And that's, of course, the annoying thing when you play against a blue player, right? You're always wondering, is he allowing me to play it? Or, or does it mean he doesn't have a counter spell? Because I think in this case, of course, Sylvan is a very good card, but I can also choose to keep my counter spell in hand to counter whatever he wants to play out with the Sylvan. And then he's also going to take extra damage because he's probably going to take an extra card or two. You know, so, so that's kind of the double, that's kind of my, my, my train of thought when I'm making these decisions. It's like I said in the deck tech, with my deck, you really have to think about what you're going to counter. That is just decisive in winning or losing. Tapping down the Mistress Factory here, untapping again everything. So I'm probably going to swing in again. Anis is on 12. Tapping it down. Okay, so I'm choosing to swing, putting him on 8. It does mean that he can then attack me. Oh no, I'm untapping the Urnum, of course. And oh, look at that, playing a Ghost Ship. So this is pretty good news. The Ghost Ship is a flyer. There, I do see a side Blast, but the side Blast, of course, is going to hurt Anis. But he can use the side Blast on the Ghost Ship. I don't have mana open. Oh, he's got more options. First plays the Swords to Plowshares, playing a Counter Spell on the Swords. Is he now going to play out the Psy Blast? That is the big question. Maybe he wants to wait for a scenario where he can actually block. Then again, I can take it back with the Maze. I think if I would be Anis right now, I mean, it's a tough spot where he's in, but I would probably play the Psy Blast on a Ghost Ship. It's difficult because Psy Blast also deals two damage, so it will put him on six. The, the thing I'm saying that is that, yes, of course, Anis can block uh, my Urnum Jin on uh, a Mishra's Factory uh, and then play a Side Blast, but then in response, I can decide to, you know, take my Urnum out of combat with my Maze of If, so then it doesn't take any damage at all, and it only takes the four damage from the Side Blast. And it looks like now, in response to my tap of the Mishra's Factory, he's going to use his own Mishra's Factory to pump up the other one. So it's now a 3-3 three, three Mistress Factory attacking with both. This is a 2-4 Flyer. So he's going to go... Oh, he's going to take all the damage. He's going to go down to 2. So maybe he doesn't have a Psy Blast in hand. Maybe I, I didn't see it correct. And I'm untapping the Urnum here and passing turn. Things are looking really, really good for me. I guess if you're on niche, you're hoping to find a balance here. That's the only card that can save him, right? Because it destroys both of my creatures. That would actually put him in a really good spot if he can find a balance. I've got only have two cards in hand. Anis also has two cards in hand. Game number three. And oh, I've won this one. Oh, it, oh I thought it was a Cyblast, but it was a Tranquility. My bad, my bad, oh man. Wow, and I still had a counter spell in hand there to protect my creatures, wow. Okay, so I'm really happy with this. This means I've won match number three. My deck is still undefeated. And uh, this is a luxury for me. It doesn't happen that often. Looks like we're going to have a look at what we boarded out. And look at that, I actually boarded out my city in a bottle in games number two and three. I also boarded out a pirate ship a Timmy and a Mamo to Jin, and I think I boarded in at least two more mazes of If. I believe also maybe one or two Ghost Ships, and I boarded in Control Magics as well. So I was playing with a full playset of Control Magics in uh, in game number two and game number three, which I think works really well against uh, the deck of Anis for the simple reason that he plays with so many beefy creatures. They're just great creatures to you know steal with my Control Magic. Anyway, super happy with this win. And also, thank you, Anis, man. What a thriller of a match. It's always a joy to play against you. And um, yeah, if you enjoyed the tournament, if you want to see more action, um, just come back next week, because then I'll have another uh, episode for you live from, well, not live, <laughs> but recorded live, I should say, 
uh, from the Often Troll Cup in Leeuwarden, the Netherlands. For now, thank you very much for watching. And before you go, I would just like to ask that if you're new to the channel, welcome. Please consider subscribing and ring that bell. That all helps. And if you're a regular, welcome back to Timmy Talks. Um, please consider uh, liking this video. That helps the channel grow. And you can also leave a comment. And there's one last thing that you can do, and that is you can also become a sponsor of the channel, a financial sponsor. And you can do that very simply through Patreon. So you can become a patron of the channel. The cool thing is it already starts with $1 a month. And with that $1, you're supporting the channel. So you're supporting me as a content creator, but also you get access to the Timmy Talks Discord. You can talk to all the other patrons and your name will be mentioned in the end scroll. How cool is that? Talking about the end scroll, let's go and have a look at our amazing, fantastic, wonderful patrons and channel members of Timmy Talks. Ik het dus, ik het dus, zomaar gezien.